This talk is about remote imaging using PRISM. My name is Bob Sandness and I'm with PRISM America. First of all, let's take a look at the topics we're going to cover. We'll talk a little bit about why remote imaging. Then we'll talk about what to look for in a remote site. Uh, talk a little bit more about the site that I'm currently located at, which is down in Chile's Atacama Desert. Talk about the software needs uh, for remote imaging and how PRISM provides an ideal solution for that. And then we'll also take a look at a remote imaging session that I recorded. Why remote imaging? Well, a bunch of reasons. First of all, uh, dark skies. We get away from light pollution, which is something that really causes problems. At the end of the day, we all want to get the best signal to noise ratio on the data that we capture. And to do that, you want to get away from as much light pollution as you can. Clear nights is another reason. Uh, ideally, having more than 250 clear nights per year. Uh, many locations in the world uh, don't enjoy uh, a number of clear nights or a reasonable number of clear nights per year. And this is a way of getting around that problem. Another desire is to get better scene conditions. Uh, some sites that are remote can offer seeing on the order of one to one and a half arc seconds, seeing on a very consistent basis. Generally there, you're up at the top of a mountain or on a, a mountain side in order to get away from the uh, seeing effects down in the valleys. The other thing you want to do is you want to avoid the long drives, the setup, the camping and so forth. And if you're like me, as you get older, those long drives and all that hassle just starts to become a little bit too onerous. And the way to avoid that is to have a remote imaging setup. Some of the activities that you can do, of course, using that remote site include uh, some amazing astrophotography, a large number of APODs or astrophoto of the days uh, that are on the NASA site uh, have often come from remote imaging uh, units. And the other thing you can do, of course, is you can do extended monitoring. Planetary is a good example where you can monitor a, an object for an extended period of time because you've got that dedicated site uh, that is not inhibited by uh, other considerations. One of my friends is currently doing a complete sky atlas. Uh, he's using a Canon 6D with a 35, 135 millimeter lens, and he's uh, just taking exposures, covering the entire sky to build up his own personal sky atlas in a photographic form. There's a lot of pro-am science that can be done as well using a remote site. Variable stars, of course, are, are a good example. Uh, one of the observers at the location I'm at uh, has contributed literally tens of thousands of variable star measurements as a result of having that remote site available and a large number of clear nights. Supernova search and follow-up is another activity that's quite popular. Uh, you can hit a large number of targets uh, over the course of an evening uh, and uh, with computer control it's, it's pretty easy to do follow-up on those and determine whether or not you've got a, a new supernova. Asteroid and comet discovery and light curves are also popular uh, and can be easily done. And again, of course, the goal here is to get as deep as possible uh, in order to get faint asteroids and to discover new comets as well as getting quality data for your light curves. And of course, with the remote site, you've got the reduced light pollution, darker skies, which aid that. Occultations is an area that I've gotten involved with over the last few years at my remote site. And it's an exciting way to determine a lot of uh, information about objects within our solar system, as well as to uh, get more positional information from an astrometric point of view. Exoplanet detection and follow-up is another activity you can, you can easily do. And again, you can follow a wide range of objects over an extended period of time. Some of the factors to consider when you're looking at a remote site include support, security, and proximity. Support because even if you've got a perfect remote site, you can still have issues where you need to have somebody go and do something at that site. And that could be a farmer down the road, or it could be a friend, or it could be someone who actually takes care of a farm of telescopes. But that's something that I found is, is really highly desirable. Security, of course, is important when you're putting tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment at a remote location. And proximity is another consideration, particularly if you don't have someone to do support work. You don't really want to have that site necessarily be a two hour drive away. 
Uh, a lot of people will tend to aim for a two to three hour driveway as kind of a compromise in terms of the proximity issue. Weather factors, of course, to consider, as we've mentioned, clear nights and uh, wind. Um, you can have a clear night, but if it's incredibly windy, then you may not be able to use that clear night. Seeing conditions are also consideration depending upon the type of observing you're doing. And extremes. Uh, at the chilly site, it's not unusual to have temperatures up to 30 degrees plus and all the way down to about minus 20 degrees uh, Celsius. So you can get some fairly large extremes in terms of uh, temperatures at these locations. Power reliability is very important. Um, you've got to have a stable source of power in order to run the observatory. And internet speed is another consideration. With some of the remote sites, the only option is really satellite internet, and that can be quite costly and very much speed limited. Hazards are also something to consider. Uh, you've got things like wildfires and flash floods uh, in uh, some of the desert locations because uh, they're very, very dry. And so that's just the reality of of those locations. Earthquakes is something we deal with in Chile. And another consideration, of course, are critters and insects that get inside your equipment and can cause all sorts of challenges. And cost is the other consideration. Uh, some remote sites are quite inexpensive. You're looking at like a thousand dollars a month. Um, sorry, a thousand dollars a year. Uh, and others are up around uh, twenty thousand dollars a year. So there's a wide variability in terms of the cost considerations. My own experience in terms of remote sites started in Australia, uh, beginning back in 2008 uh, for a year. It was a shared facility and it was recommended by more advanced imagers than myself. What I found there was an incredible amount of cloud, high winds, smoke from brush fires, and uh, uh, nearby flooding as well. So it was not much fun uh, from a location. I think we had a total of maybe about 10 or 15 good nights of observing uh, over that whole period of time. So what I learned is really do your own homework, check it out thoroughly and uh, use all the sources of data that are available. And if you can possibly do it, visit the site if you can. As a result of that experience, uh, I went down and I visited uh, the site in Chile where I am now so that I could actually see what it was all about. It's located near San Pedro de Atacama and you can see on the map here, the main entry point for all international travelers into Santiago. And then uh, to get to uh, my observatory, you have to go back up to Kalama and it's located right at the uh, edge of the Bolivian border, right on, on the boundary there. It's at 2,400 meters or about 8,000 feet. The sky brightness is very dark. It's about 21.8. There's a little bit of light that comes from San Pedro and a few uh, odd lights in the distance kind of thing, but still it's an excellent sight. Seeing is not spectacular. It's about 1.4 to 2.5 arc seconds. It's down in the valley floor, but that's kind of the trade-off. If you're up on the side of the mountain where you get better seeing, you don't have the facilities and the power and, and the internet and everything else that we do at this site. And typically we get well over 250 clear nights per year. The observatory itself is shown here. This is the, the main telescope with a piggyback telescope. It's in a clamshell dome and uh, uh, the Milky Way and Magellanic clouds are quite spectacular visually from this site. It's, uh, it's registered with the IAU as W97. It's called the Atacama Desert Observatory. And that photo was kindly supplied by Malcolm Park. The site itself is uh, managed by Alain and Ale uh, Maori. And this is a picture of Alain. He originally came from France, uh, went to work at the Palomar Observatory. And then after that, went down to Chile, worked at the European Southern Observatory, ultimately deciding to buy his own piece of land and to create an observatory farm and facility on that site. He's got over 12 observatories there. It's very much an international group with uh, observers from Panama, the USA, Poland, Belgium, France. Nice thing about it is there's motel accommodations available on site with full kitchen and bath. So you're not roughing it when you go to visit your site and do work on it. And there's lots of tourist activities being close to San Pedro de Atacama. The site itself uh, that I have, uh, the, the observatory that I have there includes a 14 and a half inch reflector with currently an STL 11,000 camera. 
uh, the 12-foot camshell dome, as I mentioned, which has a vellum and PCB control card. The PC I'm using is an ultra low power fanless. It's slow by I7 type standards, but it's completely sealed. Uh, it's solid state uh, drive, so there's nothing that's gonna go wrong with it. And I found it to be very reliable. So we're, we're very pleased with that. And it avoids a lot of the problems. Previously used laptops, and I found that after a year or so, the laptops all seem to have some sort of an issue. The mount is a Pangea mount, uh, which is a direct drive, 10 degree per second mount, and it has encoders which provide zero periodic error. Remote operation is done through TeamViewer, and TeamViewer is a great program, and fortunately they offer a free version where you're doing personal work like your own observatory, and it uh, provides very quick response, very high quality, and it's just like you're sitting right in front of your screen uh, in Chile when you're using TeamViewer. What I do with the files is I have them stored locally, but then I also have them put into Dropbox and they're transferred automatically. So as I take an exposure, it's going into Dropbox and it's actually being transmitted via the internet at a fairly slow rate, uh, but it appears at my home computer shortly thereafter. Some of the activities down there, as I mentioned, include astrophotography and with the uh, skies down there, it's not too difficult to get some very nice uh, images and a couple of examples I've got thrown up here. But one of the things that I've enjoyed doing a lot is really some of the science uh, side activities. This is an occultation of Pluto. And unfortunately during this occultation uh, where Pluto and, and its uh, satellites went in front of a star, uh, it, it was a situation where my main CCD camera on the 14 inch scope had uh, become very erratic. So I was forced to use the off axis guider. And so the data you see here is a little bit on the noisy side, but you clearly see the passage of uh, Charon. And then a little bit later, you see Pluto's passage. And of course, from the timings on these uh, events and the spacing between them, you can learn a lot about the actual geometry and size of the objects and so forth. So uh, very rewarding. All this data, of course, gets uh, processed and sent into the professional observers, um, astronomers who are actually coordinating all the activities and they add it to the data that's available. One particularly interesting occultation event that I observed was the discovery of a ring system around uh, asteroid number 10199, um, which resulted in an article in uh, the Nature magazine, and very fortunate to be included among the list of authors for that. And this was a case where there was a whole array of different professional and amateur astronomers across South America they were observing to determine the nature and extent of the rings around uh, this particular asteroid. As a result of all those ob observations, the professional astronomers will be able to determine the exact size and nature of those rings uh, in that system. On another occasion, uh, I had a call from a land uh, who runs the facility that he had just heard from a professional astronomer at the University of Geneva. Uh, that astronomer had had a hit on his supernova detector in Spain and said, could somebody please go take a look at that area? And that area happened to be this star right in the center of this field. So I took a few exposures, didn't see anything too exciting. But once we put the exposures together into a short movie that you see here, you can see how that star brightens dramatically. So it turned out it wasn't a supernova, but in fact it was a flare star. And nonetheless, some valuable data was captured. So an overall general rule for success down in remote observing is really to try to keep it as simple as possible. Don't make it overly complex. Some people will try to have three or four scopes going simultaneously with multiple cameras and uh, all sorts of things going at the same time. That kind of complexity can really be the enemy of reliability. And so in many cases, you can do some very sophisticated work with sophisticated tools, but the key thing is to basically have a system that is very reliable and very simple in terms of trying to operate it. Some of the examples of complexity on the hardware side, uh, in Australia, the telescope uh, used a rotator to find guide stars. My partner managed to rotate it over 450 degrees and, uh, to rip the USB connector out of the main CCD camera. That cost $1,000 and four weeks of downtime when the camera was shipped back to the manufacturer for repair. 
On the software side, in Chile, I had a full suite of different programs automating the operation and working perfectly until, until one of the programs was updated. Then plate solving operations stopped working. Which program was it? Uh, was it Maxim? Was it, Folk? Was it uh, Pinpoint? Uh, was it uh, CCD Autopilot? I never did figure out the, uh, the answer to that. At the end of the day, there's a large number of remote site Astro software functions that are required, including camera control, some basic image processing, planetarium function, control over your mount, ability to plate solve, have a pointing model, do focusing, astrometric analysis, automatic control of your imaging process, dome and roof control, and weather monitoring. And so with that in mind, and having had the experience in terms of using a suite of different software packages, I made the move to Prism. And fortunately, there was, there was a site license for the existing Prism software, which meant it was free to use and experiment with. And it's a unique all-in-one solution. It has a very sophisticated amount of functionality and the ability to do advanced work all in one program. Over a thousand users in Europe with many uh, professional users as well. And once I started using it, I didn't, didn't want to stop. I found that when I tried to go back to using the old programs, I realized, gee, I can do this a lot faster in the PRISM program than, uh, than I can with the suite of programs. But there are some problems that the existing PRISM program had at that time. And this goes back about two years ago. Uh, it had very poor English documentation. Uh, it was a convoluted menu system, having been developed originally for French users by a French programmer about 30% of the messages that popped up always seemed to be in French, no matter what you did. So I worked with fellow observatory owner, Joachim, and with the program developer, Cyril, and we redesigned the menu structure to rationalize it much more closely. We removed some of the obscure functions that had been put in there just for the use by uh, a professional astronomer for a specific uh, functionality for a specific application translated all the messages into English, developed English documentation in a series of tutorial videos on this channel. And in October of last year, the new PRISM version 10 was released. So the motto that we have basically is that we have PRISM, which is one program and a total solution. And the functionality that goes with that is really quite amazing. Um, it, it, combines all of the functionality of the typical suite of programs, plus it adds some very advanced features not found in any of those programs. We have a user uh, interface, which is both friendly and intuitive, detailed sky charts, mountain observatory control, the ability to control all the different ASCOM CCD cameras, as well as Canon DSLRs, the ability to run ASCOM filter wheels and focusers, uh, pointing model and plate solving are built in, Autofocus, auto center capability, again, is built into the program. The ability to calibrate your images, stack, process them. There's also the ability to have fully automated imaging from the point of view of opening up the observatory, powering up the cameras and everything else, going and, and capturing the data from all your different targets and then doing a complete shutdown at the end as well. There's asteroid and comet detection and uh, discovery capability, a full photometry suite in there, including exoplanet detection. There's also the ability of doing analysis over your, the image quality and selection, and polar alignment and PEC, of course, are in there as well. Uh, full control over the dome and shelter, and a powerful scripting language that you can write your own little uh, uh, simple scripts, if you will, to create specialized programs. Rather than go through a tour of PRISM at this point in time, what I suggest you do is take a look at the other um, videos on this channel, this YouTube channel, and uh, take a look at the tours that are available there. There's one which is about a 40 minute long tour and another one that's about eight minutes long. And you'd be able to go through that at your leisure and, uh, and enjoy the uh, various features and functionality. One thing I do want to talk about is the uh, unique features that are in PRISM, and just a few of them are listed here. And that includes the ability of doing simultaneous dual imaging. PRISM is quite unique and, and far more advanced than most image capture programs in the sense that we don't have an intrinsic limit in terms of the number of CCD cameras we can support. In the pro version, we support two cameras, and in the advanced version, we'll support three. 
um, and it has the ability of capturing images simultaneously with your main scope while capturing wide field images with another scope or camera lens. Polar alignment is another unique feature because we offer the king method and that's something that I've used uh, very effectively, particularly when you're in the southern hemisphere. It makes it very quick to be able to do a polar alignment. We can compute the sky background level, which can also be done if you want to use a meter, uh, one of the meters from uh, Uniheadrun, which is an excellent product, but we can also do it directly with the uh, uh, analysis tool that we have built into PRISM. And we can calculate an estimate of the limiting magnitude of any image as well by using the photometry function that's built into PRISM. There's also a function which takes a look at the optical collimation and tilt analysis, and it does that by taking a series of exposures as it moves the focuser along and then analyzing to determine how closely that whole system, the CCD and focuser, are aligned to the optical axis of the telescope. Very handy feature is the ability of displaying all asteroids and comets on any image. Uh, so that you may take one of your older images and run it through that system and determine that, you, in fact, you did capture some fairly faint asteroids. You can also download deep sky survey images from either the ESO site or from the Space Telescope site, and you can compare that to your images as you get them in real time. And just to show you the uh, limiting magnitude function, um, this image up in the top corner here was taken for about six hours of exposure time with a 14-inch telescope. And running it through the program, we can see that the uh, stars themselves uh, increase in terms of the number of stars we have in the image as you go uh, towards uh, the fainter magnitudes, which is what you would expect. And then there's an inflection point at 22.2 or so when the star count starts to drop off. And that effectively gives you what the limiting magnitude is for a signal to noise ratio that's been set at three. There's actually a application note on the NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center website, which talks about how many stars there are in the sky. And they have a very convenient formula that you can use that tells you uh, the number of stars uh, given the magnitude and the uh, area that you're looking at. And it would predict in this case, for example, if we're roughly 500 stars here, then for 23rd magnitude, we should be up at about 900. And in fact, we're only at about 200. So it means we're only getting about one out of five stars, but it gives us a very good estimator of our limiting magnitude. Professionals are using PRISM. You, you, the European Southern Observatory uses PRISM as part of their CCD characterization testing. And they also use it uh, for scripting functions. It's very handy for them to create scripts to do specific applications. Amateurs are also using PRISM. Uh, it's used for the Atacama Sky Survey over the past year to take over 20,000 images. And that's uh, something that's ongoing. And you can see the typical uh, screenshot here uh, where the area on the uh, sky chart is showing you the different fields that are being captured as it moves along and takes successive frames searching for new asteroids as well as for comets and of recovering existing asteroids. Another application is to use PRISM for exoplanet uh, detection, and you can see a very clear exoplanet event taking place in the data captured by another amateur uh, using PRISM. Next, we'll take a look at a remote session that was captured uh, from the site down in Chile. So this video starts off where we've got the observatory opened, powers up, and now what we're doing is we're going over and we're selecting the cool down temperature for the CCD camera. So we'll set it for cool, we'll apply, and we also have selected a graph so we'll be able to monitor the progress of the cool down on a, conveniently on a graph. There's also a power graph available if you want it. And what I've done in this video is I've accelerated time so we don't have to sit here and wait. So through the magic of video, the camera's now cooled down. And next, we can go ahead and we can hook up the rest of the system. And we'll do that. And what it'll do is now the program will go out, link out the mount, and uh, the focuser filter wheel 
all of that good stuff is going to be all linked together so it'll be all ready for complete usage and again just a reminder this this PC is fanless it's slow but it, it gets the job done and that all looks good then we'll click on OK so there we've got the focuser up and running and you can see by the little red flashing light that it's interrogating the focuser position continuously and we've also got a chart up for the mount which shows you there that little red circle right there is showing you the position of the telescope so a very handy way of seeing exactly where the telescope is pointed but let's go open up a sky chart which will give us a uh, much more detailed view of the sky and we have complete control over all the elements of the sky chart as you would expect as you can see on the setup page we will go ahead and change the CCD orientation just to demonstrate how that uh, can be done there's actually an automatic function to determine what your orientation is for your CCD camera uh, but we'll do it manually in this case next we'll go ahead and we'll get a global view of the sky and we can center it up uh, on the zenith as well by clicking on by right clicking I should say and then hitting the uh, horizon function and selecting the zenith option next we'll uh, go and turn off some of the stars we've got on there we've got the GSC catalog that's on so we'll just quickly turn that off and it'll repaint the screen still have lots of objects on that particular display you can see from the yellow indicator there that's where the telescope is currently pointing and now we'll go and select the target to uh, move the telescope to and pick M83 which is conveniently located and it shows us by the flashing indicator and then ask for confirmation and tells us it's 50 degrees above the horizon looks good and the slewing in progress indicator shows that we're slewing along and the speed built up to a considerable level but of course it has to slow down pretty quick as well but there we are we're completely slewed over there now we can adjust the zoom factor so we can see more clearly exactly the target we're looking at and we just pick a zoom factor that gets us pretty close to where we want to be and we can see we're we're pretty much centered on the target but we can easily recenter that by just going up there and clicking on center and now it'll be positioned in the center of our screen so the telescope thinks it's pointing directly at m83 uh, I've turned off the pointing model so the answer is probably not but we'll uh, be able to find out fairly quickly by taking an initial exposure and seeing exactly where it is and again I've accelerated time here so that we'll finish this exposure very quickly and there's M83 and you can see it's a little off target not not too bad but a little bit off and uh, so let's go down and use our telescope tools find our telescope position by doing a uh, plate solve on that plate and the parameters are all default type parameters so one of the nice things about prism it does most of the work for you it'll now go ahead and scan the field first extract a bunch of stars and it found about 5,000 stars it'll compare that to the star catalog that I selected and uh, then come back and tell us where we're actually pointing and there it's done a recalibrate and we'll say yes we want to recalibrate to that new position and then we can just click on M83 and say let's slew the telescope back to that point and that should put us right on target so we'll take another quick exposure and there it is all of this I'm doing manually in the real uh, remote observing world this is all going to be done automatically and a little bit later we'll talk about the automatic way of doing all of this 
So now what we'll do is we'll uh, take a short exposure and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, actually focus the telescope using the autofocus routine. So typically we use about a five second exposure. And this download you're seeing right now is actually in real time. The uh, camera, the STL 11000 is a wonderful camera but it has a very slow readout time, so it's a little painful from that perspective, but it, uh, it certainly gets the job done and it's, it's great value for the money. So there's our M83 image uh, for five seconds. And uh, we then have another options as to how we want to uh, do the focusing. We'll go up there and we'll select the autofocus uh, option that makes the most sense right now, which is simply we go on the image, we select a star, and it'll use that star to actually focus the, uh, the camera. We'll say yes, we want to go ahead and do that integration. And here we've got a, a fairly large number of uh, iterations. We're going to do nine shots to actually focus it. Typically, we only use about six or seven. First of all, it'll do a dark frame, and then it'll start doing uh, very small light frames around that star to determine the actual size of the star image and uh, determine the optimum focal point. And there's the first one, which shows that we're about 7.3 pixels for the uh, half uh, flux diameter. And here we've now completed the exposure cycles, and we can see from the parabolic graph that's fitted to those points that the optimum focal point is about 14.099 uh, millimeters. And so that's automatically loaded into the system. So now we've got the system perfectly focused. And uh, you can see from that, that image uh, that we just took, it's, uh, it's quite a sharp image. So now what we'll demonstrate is the ability of taking a quick sequence of images. Now that we've got the system set up and focused, we can bang off a bunch of images by simply uh, creating a folder by pushing the night folder button, putting in a generic name for the sequence of images, in this case M83. We've selected 180 seconds, so three minute exposures. We're going to do a loop and we can specify how many we want to, to do. And we've also specified down at the bottom beside the save button that we're going to auto write these to disk. So those three exposures will now be done completely automatically and we confirm that we want to do an auto record and an exposure loop and away it goes and it'll count down and then execute those. Now there's a more powerful tool that's built into PRISM uh, and that is automatic observations. And automatic observations allows us to select a series of targets and then specify exactly how we want to ha handle each of those. So we'll go ahead and import from our object list one of those targets that I created a little bit earlier. And we have complete control over the exposure time, binning, number of images, which filter we want to use. And in this case, we'll use filter number five, I think it is. And that's our luminance filter. We're not going to be doing auto guiding because these are very short exposures. But we're going to go ahead and do a focusing cycle first on this particular object. We can specify how we want to do focusing for all the objects, how we want to control our dome and shelter, uh, the exact place we want to put our images, as well as whether or not we want to do rotation on any of the images before they're saved. Uh, telescope parameters in terms of the prioritization of targets and the meridian slew limits. If we want to do flat recording, we can do that as well, as well as the startup and shutdown functions that we want to execute. And how we want to handle any errors that might occur during the sequence. And then finally, once we're happy with everything, we go to the execute tab and we hit the run button. And then we get a complete log which shows us exactly what the system's doing and how it's going and slewing to a target, doing a focusing cycle on it. It's verifying whether or not, uh, if the weather station has been activated, it'll be checking for, for cloud or for rain, that kind of thing. And it has automatic shutdown capability associated with that. 
So again, to remember that uh, PRISM is a very, very sophisticated program that's got the ability of handling all the functionality you need for fully automated imaging. And now we've uh, started that whole process and very quickly and magically we finished it. In this case, we just took a single exposure of the Leo triplet and that's what's in behind uh, this particular um, panel. And in the real world, we'd normally take a whole bunch of exposures and we may well be auto guiding on all these exposures. It's got the ability of selecting, dithering and so forth. And there we are, it's got the complete uh, uh, image that's ready to be incorporated into our processing cycle and to go from there. And that gives you a very quick um, introduction into remote imaging. And the, uh, the key message really is that PRISM is an ideal solution for remote imaging because of the fact it incorporates all those functions and it records all those functions at a very sophisticated level to allow you to do everything that you could conceivably want to do in a remote observation situation. And of course, at the end of the night, dawn starts coming up over the uh, dormant volcanoes off in the distance, and we can see the bit of the moon rising there as well. And that concludes our uh, talk on, on PRISM. Thank you.